compressor piston rods are made from various types of steel depending on stress levels and the composition of the gas to be handled. Low carbon steels and low alloy steels are commonly used. For certain corrosive gases, stainless steels or hastalloy steels may be used. Now, take a look at the following cross-sectional view of a typical double-acting reciprocating compressor. Here, the normal frictional forces generated by the reciprocating motion of the piston rod and acting between the piston rod packing rings and the piston rod increase with pressure. In my industrial experience, piston rod packing wear becomes excessive with pressures above 1000 psi. Therefore, a piston rod with a hardened surface in the packing area will have less wear than will one not so hardened. This hardening may take the form of carburizing, nitriding, induction hardening, plasma spray with chrome oxide, tungsten carbide, or flame hardening. Keep in mind, this also implies that surface finish is important. In this video, we will discuss how the piston rod is connected to the crosshead. Let's have a closer look. For the reciprocating compressor depicted here, we can identify the pistons, the piston rods, and their connection, as we have seen in a previous video. The crossheads of this compressor are located here. You can see now a figure presenting typical examples of crossheads. So, in this video, we will focus our attention on this part of the compressor. We will present the different ways the piston rod is connected to the crosshead. Now, as you can see here, the piston rod and the crosshead are connected by screwing the piston rod into the crosshead and locking it with a knot. Actually, various types of additional features are built in to lock the piston rod. In this video, we will discuss the main types of connections. These are castellated rod end with locking dowel, jam screw lock, and multi bolt piston rod locking device. For the first type of connection, you can see here a piston rod where the rod end is machined with castellations. In addition to a locking knot that you can see here, which is tightened against the face of the crosshead, a pin or lock dowel, as highlighted in this example, is inserted through the crosshead to prevent rotation. A typical jam screw locking arrangement is shown. In this arrangement, holes are drilled and tapped in the lock knot. The arrangement uses several set screws through the knot, as highlighted here. These set screws bear against the surface of the crosshead. The setup also uses set screws and copper discs through the knot, which bears against the piston rod threads. The copper discs are inserted to prevent damage to the threads. In addition, lock wires are also used to prevent loosening. Finally, in this arrangement, a circular knot is used instead of the hexagonal knot. In this arrangement, 4 to 8 bolts fasten the knot to the face of the crosshead allowing a clearance of 0.5 to 1 mm between the knot and the crosshead faces and tightening the bolts of the knot effectively locks the piston rod. In this video, we will talk about crossheads. Let's have a closer look. 
depicted here is a typical crosshead assembly at the end of the connecting rod. Starting our way from top to bottom, this typical crosshead assembly includes two crosshead shoes, one at the top and one at the bottom, a crosshead, a crosshead pin bushing, a crosshead pin, and a connecting rod end. Crossheads in reciprocating compressors are made of cast iron or nodular iron. Crosshead shoes, as highlighted here, are usually made of cast iron with babbit overlay or aluminum and are bolted to the crosshead. The piston rod is threaded into the crosshead and is locked with a dowel or set screws. Let's now dismantle this crosshead. First, the piston rod lock dowel is removed. The bolt is unscrewed in the anti-clockwise direction. The piston rod is unscrewed and then removed. Next, the crosshead pin bushing and the crosshead pin are removed. Now, the connecting rod small end can be slided and disassembled. Once this is done, the crosshead shoe knots can be unbolted to allow the removal of the bolts. The last pieces that you can see here are the crosshead shoes and the crosshead itself. You can see here a cross-sectional view of a vertical multi-stage double-acting compressor. In this example, the compressor has two cylinders. Now, for a reminder, starting our way from top to bottom, this reciprocating compressor includes a piston, a piston rod packing, a piston rod, a crosshead, a connecting rod, and the crankshaft. Let's focus our attention on the crankshaft. Crankshafts in reciprocating compressors, as the one you can see here, are made from carbon steel forgings or nodular iron castings. In general, the shafts are not dynamically balanced unless they are used for rotative speed requirements of 900 RPM and above. Let's now observe the crankshaft in operation. Ok, now that we have seen each component individually, let's have a look at the overall assembly. In other words, let's have a look at the crankshaft, rod, crosshead, piston assembly. The assembly I'm referring to is highlighted here in yellow, in this example depicting a horizontal reciprocating compressor. Starting our way from left to right, this assembly includes a crankshaft with its crank pin bushing, a connecting rod that connects the crankshaft to the crosshead and its associated crosshead shoe, crosshead pin bushing and crosshead pin, as discussed in a previous video. A piston rod knot that securely tightens the crosshead to the piston rod and finally a piston with its associated rings. Piston rings will be discussed in detail in the next couple of videos. Now, the connecting rod is made from a low carbon steel forging. The crank pin bushings are babbit line steel or cast iron shells. An important aspect that I want you to keep in mind at this level, since we are looking at the overall assembly, 
and which we will discuss in detail in a later section, is that lubricating oil under pressure is conducted through drilled passages from the crankshaft to the crosshead pin for lubricating purposes. This is an important aspect of reciprocating compressors and we have dedicated a separate section to cover this topic. Let's now have a closer look at the connecting rod. The end of the connecting rod, which is fixed to the crankshaft, is called the big end, as opposed to the end fixed to the crosshead, called the small end. Let's now dismantle the connecting rod and look into the various parts. First, the bolts are unscrewed, then the connecting rod big end is split into two parts. The split support saddle and the split babbit are removed. Next, the piston rod nut is unscrewed to allow the removal of the piston rod. Then the crosshead cap screws are removed, the crosshead shoes are extracted, then the crosshead pin and the crosshead can be disassembled. Finally, the crosshead pin bushing, as seen here, is removed. The last piece that you can see here is the connecting rod. Starting from this video, we will focus our attention on the piston rings. We will define the function of each type of ring, that is, what the purpose of each ring is, or what it does. By understanding what each type of ring is supposed to do, you will be in a better position to know if it's performing its duty correctly. We will present each type of ring using extensive 3D animations and cross-sectional views, state its function and operating limits. Now take a look at the following figure. It represents a compressor piston. Recall this was already seen in a previous video. As depicted here, this piston is equipped with two rider bands and a set of piston rings. Rider bands and piston rings are made from Teflon with various fillers such as glass or high-performance polymers. Rider bands are designed to support the weight of the piston and the piston rod assembly. On the other hand, piston rings are mounted onto the piston to prevent gas from blowing across the piston and to transfer heat from the piston to the cylinder walls and therefore to the water jackets. You can see here basic piston and groove dimensions of a typical piston arrangement with rider band and piston rings. Notice here that in this arrangement the piston ring radial thickness is smaller than the groove within the piston. On the other hand the rider band radial thickness is slightly larger than its groove. The reason for this will be explained in a few moments. Let's start with the rider bands. Actually, various types of rider bands are available. These can be classified into the cut type and the solid rider bands. The cut type may be of angle or butt type, as depicted in this example. In these arrangements, the ring is snapped over the piston. Side relief grooves, as highlighted here, are provided to relieve the gas pressure behind the ring so that it does not behave like a piston ring. For the solid type, as depicted in this example, these are machined with an interference fit to have a tight fit in the piston groove. They do not require relief grooves and are stretched over the end of the piston into the ring groove. 
Ok, let's now shift our attention to the piston rings. The piston rings are all of cut type and are snapped over the piston. Care must be taken during installation to prevent permanent deformation or breakage. On installation, you must make sure that the groove depth is slightly more than the radial thickness of the ring. This can easily be checked by using a straight edge as shown in this example. Now, keep in mind if you use a piston ring along with a rider band, as in this example, then make sure that the piston ring does not protrude above the rider band. Actually, piston rings should maintain contact with the cylinder wall and the side of the groove for effective sealing. To ensure the contact with the cylinder, the piston rings are made with a free diameter larger than that of the cylinder. Therefore, when installed, the piston rings exert outward pressure against the cylinder wall. However, the primary sealing force during operation is the gas pressure acting in the ring bore and on the side. As depicted here, when the piston initiates the discharge stroke, frictional forces and gas pressure force the piston ring against the opposite side of the groove. As the stroke continues, gas pressure acting in the side and end clearances forces the piston ring against the cylinder and the groove side face. Therefore, as you can see here, preventing bypass across the piston. Rod packing, as highlighted here, are provided for sealing action between the piston and the cylinder casing during the suction stroke and the discharge stroke. During the suction stroke with respect to packing ring end, as in this example, atmospheric air trying to enter the cylinder from atmosphere is restricted by sealing action of the packing rings. During the discharge stroke, again with respect to the packing ring end, gas trying to escape to the atmosphere from the cylinder is restricted by sealing action of the packing rings. The packing rings are housed in the stuffing box of the piston rod packing. As highlighted here, let's have a closer look. You can see here a 3D model representation of the packing ring and the packing cap. The piston rod packing consists of several annular packing cups, segmental packing rings, and a flange-like gland held in the cylinder head stuffing box as a complete assembly. In addition, to studs and knots that secure it against a sealing gasket. The packing ring is housed in the packing cup and is free to float in the cup. The packing rings can be classified into the tangential, radial and pressure breaker rings. Let's examine one of these rings in detail. As you can see in this example, the packing rings are made of three segments. These segments mate each other so as to form an arrangement similar to the one depicted here. Notice that the packing ring segments have grooves which accommodate the garter spring, as highlighted here. Actually, the packing ring segments are held together by the garter spring. The garter spring pressurizes the packing ring against the piston rod. As the packing ring wears, due to rubbing action against the piston, 
the segments are progressively compressed against the piston due to the spring force, therefore maintaining a tight seal around the piston rod. Finally, the packing ring is then simply housed in a packing cup depicted here in blue. The basic packing ring arrangements are single acting rings, double acting rings, and pressure breaker rings. Depending on the compressor requirement, the packing ring can be used in one or a combination of these arrangements. In this video, we will focus our attention on the first type, that is, single acting rings. The following figure depicts a typical pair of single acting rings. In single acting ring assembly, one pair of rings, which constitutes of one tangential cut ring and one radial cut ring, are housed in one packing cup. The combination provides effective sealing action in one direction only. We will see this in detail further ahead. The rings are provided with a dowel in one ring and a corresponding dowel hole in the other ring, as highlighted here. So, basically, the rings are doweled together to maintain a staggered cat arrangement. In other words, the gap between the segments in the radio ring should not coincide with the area of cat between the segments of the tangential ring. Let's now assemble the two rings together. As you can see here, the rings are doweled together to maintain the staggered cat arrangement. Now we're going to observe this arrangement by making the ring on top alternately opaque and transparent. In this view, the top ring is opaque. Notice that the gap in the radial ring and the cut in the tangential ring should not coincide. The top ring is now transparent. Notice again that the gap in the radial ring and the cut in the tangential ring should not coincide. Ok, now the doweled rings are placed inside the packing cup as seen here and sealing action in one direction only is achieved by the respective position of the rings in the packing cup. The tangential ring is placed towards the atmospheric side of the packing cup, while the radial ring is placed towards the pressure side of the packing cup. Then, the packing cups are successively placed on the piston rod, and the number of packing cups depends on the compressor requirements. When the suction stroke starts, friction between the piston and the packing ring carries along the packing rings and place it at the pressure side face of the packing cup as depicted in this simplified animation. As the suction stroke continues, there is a small entry of gas from the atmospheric side to the compressor cylinder through the space between the segments in the radial ring and the clearance between the packing ring and the packing cup. On the other hand, when the discharge stroke starts, friction between the packing rings and the piston, as well as differential pressure across the packing rings, place the rings against the adjacent packing cup side of the packing rings. As the discharge stroke continues, passage of gas to the atmospheric side is possible only by forced escape through any clearance available between the side faces of the packing cup and the tangential packing ring. The gas, on passing through successive packing cups, fizzles out due to restricted passages and eventually there is no 
or less escape to the atmospheric side. So, as seen here, in the discharge stroke, the restricted passage offered by the tangential packing ring results in gas to fizzle out as it escapes to the atmospheric side. So, to sum up, and as explained, the single acting packing ring assembly facilitates restricted entry of gas into the compressor cylinder from atmospheric side during the suction stroke and no gas leakage into the atmospheric side from the compressor cylinder during the discharge stroke. In the next video, we will shift our attention to the second type of packing rings, that is, double acting rings. Ok, let's now shift our attention to double acting rings. In double acting ring assembly, as the example you can see here, one pair of rings, which constitutes of two tangential cut rings, are housed in one packing cup. The combination provides sealing action in both directions. As in the single acting arrangement, the rings are provided with a dowel in one ring and a corresponding dowel hole in the other ring. The rings are doweled together to maintain a staggered cut arrangement. In other words, and as explained in the previous video, the cut between the segments in one tangential ring should not coincide with the area of cut between the segments of the other tangential ring. Let's now assemble the two rings. As seen here, the rings are doweled together to maintain the staggered cut arrangement. Now, as we did in the previous video, we will observe this arrangement by making the ring on top alternately opaque and transparent. In this first view, the top ring is opaque. You can see here that the cuts in the two rings do not coincide. In this next view, we have made the top ring transparent. Here again, you can see that the cuts in the two rings do not coincide. Ok, now the pair of rings are placed inside the packing cup as depicted here. And the combination provides sealing action in both directions. Packing cups are then successively placed on the piston rod. The number of cups depends on the compressor requirements. Let's now observe the packing rings in operation. We will focus on the upper half of the packing as highlighted here. When the suction stroke starts, friction between the piston and the packing ring carries along the packing rings and places it at the pressure side face of the packing cup, as highlighted in this simplified animation. As the suction stroke continues, passage of gas to compressor cylinder is possible only by forced entry through any clearance available between the pressure side face of the packing cup and the packing ring. The gas, on passing through successive packing cups, fizzles out due to restricted passages, and eventually there is no or very small amounts of gas that enter to the cylinder. This provides effective sealing during the suction stroke. On the other hand, when the discharge stroke starts, friction between packing ring and piston, as well as differential pressure across the packing ring, places the rings against the adjacent packing cup side face of the packing ring. As the discharge stroke continues, passage of gas to atmosphere is possible only by forced escape through any clearance available between the side faces of the packing cup and the packing ring. The gas, on passing through successive packing cups, fizzles out due to restricted passages and eventually here again, there will be no or very small amounts of gas that escape to the atmospheric side. So, 
to sum up our discussion, as explained, the double acting packing ring assembly facilitates restricted entry of gas into the compressor cylinder from the atmospheric side during the suction stroke and restricted gas leakage into the atmospheric side from the compressor cylinder during the discharge stroke. In this video, we will shift our attention to the third type of packing rings, that is, pressure breaker rings. The pressure breaker ring arrangement, as the one depicted here, consists of only one radial cut ring. Here, the radial ring has a gap between only two of the segments, and there is no gap between the other segments. The pressure breaker ring is placed inside the packing cup, as you can see here, and can be placed with either side, facing the compressor cylinder or facing the atmosphere. The assembly is then placed in the first or second position on the compressor cylinder side. Let's observe the ring in operation. We will focus on the upper half of the packing. During the suction stroke, friction between the piston and the packing ring carries along the packing ring and places it at the pressure side face of the packing cup. As the suction stroke continues, there is a small entry of gas from the atmospheric side to the compressor cylinder through the space between the segments in the pressure breaker ring and the clearance existing between the packing ring and the packing cup as depicted in this simplified animation. On the other hand, during the discharge stroke, friction between packing ring and piston, as well as differential pressure across the packing ring, places the ring against the adjacent packing cup side face of the packing ring. As the discharge stroke continues, there is a small passage of gas from the compressor side to the atmospheric side through the space between the segments in the radial ring and the clearance existing between the packing ring and the packing cup, as seen here. So, to sum up our discussion, keep in mind that pressure breaker rings are installed at the innermost cups of the stuffing box assembly and are used to reduce the amount of gas reaching the successive packing rings during the discharge stroke. The piston rod packings are located at the cylinder rear head, as highlighted here in this example. Let's have a closer look. In general, compressor packings are lubricated. The lubricating oil is supplied from a mechanical lubricator. We will see this in detail in the compressor lubrication section. The casing of the packing is actually drilled so as to supply oil to the oil cups and a hole is drilled in the oil cup through which oil reaches the piston rod, as depicted here. The packings are vented to the atmosphere by means of drilled passages through vent cups. In addition, packing cups may be arranged to vent higher pressure or to introduce pressure between any of the individual rings. This is done to prevent leakage or to provide means for recovering the leaked gas. Ok, let's now look into the exploded view of a typical packing arrangement. To do that, we begin by removing the bolts which hold the flange against the stuffing box. Next, we remove the flange and internal components and you can see here the exploded view of the packing. Notice that the piston rod packing of reciprocating compressors is actually made of successive rings 
housed in packing cups. The rings can be of the single acting or double acting type or combination of both and always arranged in pairs. In addition to a single pressure breaker ring, which is, if you recall, always placed at the innermost cap of the packing assembly. The stuffer in the frame ahead of the cylinder housing contains a set of piston rod oil scraper rings and a gland. This assembly is highlighted here in the yellow box. It is the oil wiper packing. A typical wiper packing is seen here. Oil wiper packings are designed to seal the oil from the crankcase. By scraping away the excess oil generated along the piston rod by its back and forwards movement, the oil wiper rings prevent any accidental leakage outside the crankcase.